Good morning from Oslo. I'm happy to welcome you to day two of the European Palliative Care Research Center seminar. My name is uh, Ola Alexander Oktalsay, and I'm the deputy CEO of the Norwegian Cancer Society, a proud co-partner of this seminar. I hope you all uh, enjoyed yesterday's excellent presentation, and I think today we will have an equal interesting program today. This day we'll cover two of the main topics within the palliative research care uh, research areas: nutritional aspects for patients with advanced cancer and health service research. More specifically how patient-reported outcome measures can be used in clinical practice as well as quality registers, and patient-centered care and patient involvement in early clinical trials. There will also be presentation of two selected abstracts in the program today. And at the end of the day, there will be a panel discussion on palliative care and clinical studies including more cancer patients, including palliative care patients into clinical studies, is one of the prioritized areas for the Norwegian Cancer Society. So I'm really looking forward to today, for this day. I think the topics that will co be covered today is very important for today's and tomorrow's cancer care. So. With these words, I will hand it over to today's chair, Tora Solheim and Maria Fallon. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you very much um, for that introduction. It is my huge honor uh, to introduce our first speaker this morning. It's Professor Vicky Barakos who holds the Alberta Cancer Foundation Chair in Palliative Care Medicine at the University of Alberta. Vicky has been a fantastic uh, friend, colleague, collaborator uh, of all of us with an interest in cachexia and particularly uh, within the PRC for many years now. Um, Vicky has uh, focused her career, in fact, on the pathophysiology of skeletal muscle atrophy. Uh, and that effort has encompassed both, both basic research uh, and translational as far as the bedside, uh, with, of course, her seminal work in the evaluation of lean mass, skeletal muscle mass using CT methodology. Uh, Vicky has many uh, seminal publications and of course her highlights are the Lance Oncology, Nature Disease Reviews and uh, more recently the JCO. It's my great pleasure this morning to introduce Vicky. Uh, thank you very much. Hello everyone from Canada. It's morning here too, just a different part of the morning. And I'm here with you today for an update on the definition and classification of cancer cachexia. Do you know I was a fundamental biologist before coming to the Cross Cancer Institute about 17 years ago. And when I arrived, I learned that at that time there was at least 24 different classifications of cancer cachexia available in the literature. This was very bewildering to me, but I soon understood that there were also 20 classifications for malignant pain syndrome and probably 30 classifications for cancer fatigue. It's a comment on the state of the science. We are learning how to define and classify these symptoms. May I have the next slide, please? A classification and definition is required to do anything. So to begin the process, Ken Firon gathered a group of clinical experts and published in 2011, this paper entitled Definition and Classification of Cancer Cachexia. A point I would like to make about this consensus was it 
was conducted in a rigorous fashion by a process called Delphi, which has many steps and, and requirements. I would like to point out that when we undertook this, this, this Delphi, we set the following criteria for agreement. To be included, any statement had to have a mean score of eight out of 10 for agreement, but we also did not permit any dissenting votes. So if even one person disagreed with a statement, we would discuss, review, research, and then agree or not, as the case would be, but we needed complete agreement to come up with the statement, which is next here, the definition of cancer cachexia, a multifactorial syndrome of weight loss defined principally or most importantly by loss of muscle mass because it is that which associates with morbidity and mortality with or without loss of fat. This syndrome cannot be fully reversed by conventional nutritional support, though it can be partly reversed, and it leads to progressive functional impairment. The pathophysiology, that's to say the negative protein and energy balance, was defined to be driven by a variable combination of reduced food intake and abnormal metabolism. Next slide. This pictogram is a synopsis of that, a wasting syndrome with important muscle losses driven by deficits in food intake and uh, a, a collective of changes defined as abnormal metabolism and then impacting principally and importantly on, on physical functioning. So I want you to think about this as being kind of a concept map um, more than a classification at this point. If we go to the next slide, Another concept important, may I have the next slide, please? Another concept important about cachexia is the fact that it's progressive. So starting without weight loss, it begins, it increases, and it is cumulative over time, reaching five or 10 or eventually 20% or more. And that additive nature of the weight loss leading to progressive depletion was also um, attributed the concept of precachexia, meaning some early onset phase. Um, this precachexia did not have any diagnostic criteria at the time. And then evolving to fulminant cachexia. And finally, to an advanced stage near death of potentially refractory cachexia, a diagnostic criterion of 5% weight loss was set for the boundary of the beginning of classifiable cachexia. May I have the next slide, please? Another concept within this and related to the prior one is, is this the, the classification of severity. And this is now a description, not a classification, but a concept that this could be classified according to the degree of depletion. So how low is the BMI in combination with the degree of ongoing weight loss? What it means simply is that if, if you are going to lose five units of BMI, it probably makes a big difference whether you started at BMI 22 or you started at BMI initial value of 35. So this concept is one thing in the, in the consensus which has progressed. May I have the next slide, please? So that concept was evaluated in 2015 publication of Lisa Martin and co-workers. Lisa gathered an international cast of characters and, and developed a sample of 8,000 cases of patients with advanced cancer at risk for cachexia. To test that concept, she stratified into 25 groups this population encompassing five strata of BMI 
high and five strata of weight loss, which were defined not by somebody else, but by the by the data in this data set. The numbers in these boxes are the median overall survival of the patients in each group in months. And here you can see that if you are large and have limited weight loss, survival could be 20 months, whereas if BMI is low and weight loss has had a high magnitude, then the survival could be four to five months. So this, is, this stratification is usefully organized into a grading scale or classification, which is shown in the next slide. So in this schema, the survival bands, which are similar to each other, have simply been organized into a numeric grading scheme going from grade grade zero um, to grade four, which is convenient. It turned out that way because um, it seems that oncologists are quite capable of counting to four, um, at least where it concerns the um, scaling of cancer-associated symptoms. If you look at this grading scale then by tumor type, you can see that as it was designed, the weight loss grade scales with survival with a considerable difference in survival between weight loss grade zero um, and, and weight loss grade four. So this grading scheme aligns again with this concept of a progressive thing leading ultimately to death. May I have the next slide, please? Here, I would like to mention just briefly that muscle loss was a diagnostic criterion expressed in the original consensus. And in research, it has become quite clearly a major important diagnostic criterion. Over 600 papers have in the meantime been published um, using CT imaging me metrics to quantify and classify muscle wasting in, in patients with cancer associated with mortality and other poor outcomes. I'm not gonna stick on this um, criterion um, for the reason that I have other things I'd like to share with you. And the big issue I think with this criterion now is that it needs help to become part of the clinical workflow, which it, it presently it, it is not. So if I may have the next slide, please. I'm um, just going, going back to my schema to say that in the original consensus, the, the expression of the pathophysiology was just this simple, that food intake was impaired, that the patients were not, a, not having a good appetite, that many symptoms were impairing their eating, and then that the metabolism also seemed to be aberrant in a variety of different dimensions, but this was very poorly characterized. So I want you to jump from this perspective, which we had in the consensus in 2011 to my next slide, where I've created a synopsis from 2018 of what that blows up to now, given knowledge which has accumulated in, in, in the intervening time. So in this depiction, we understand that the tumor and its interactions with the host immune system are creating a legion of molecules that I would refer to as catabolic factors. So these catabolic factors are catabolic because they are, are molecules which can hit receptors on the end organs of cachexia, so muscle tissue and adipose tissue, and can provoke them to launch lipolysis and proteolysis. These molecules, many of them, can also interact with the central nervous system, where you have your large overarching control of body weight, profoundly altering the central nervous system's neuroendocrine outputs, 
neural outputs, and behavioral outputs, all of which are catabolic in nature and contribute further to the wasting process. So this large group of molecules now is under study, it is diversifying, it is, um, it is growing, and the potential causal um, role of these molecules is being explored. So here we have a great deal of knowledge that, that plays into our understanding of the etiology, which ultimately must be used or can help us um, make classification and diagnostic criteria. This is the simple picture. If you go to the next slide, I'll add one more slice to my onion. Cachexia rolls out in a medical oncology setting where patients with advanced cancer are being treated with systemic therapies. And I would add to this model the idea that antineoplastics as a class are very diverse. Many, many of these drugs could be called catabolic factors in a similar manner as these other molecules I described to you before. For the following reasons um, in the next slide, which I will articulate, the chemotherapy focused on the tumor goes everywhere else. It profoundly alters the central nervous system, generating further anorexia and misbehaving sympathetic neuroendocrine and behavioral outputs. It interacts potently with the gastrointestinal tract, adding a whole layer of nutritional impact symptoms and metabolic changes. So adding to the load of metabolic dysfunction and reduced food intake. And now we're learning that many antineoplastics enter muscle cells and adipocytes and directly provoke excess lipolysis and proteolysis there. So treatment is going to be a criterion value um, in our understanding of the risk of cancer cachexia. In the next slide, I'm gonna to move to my last subject, Can you change the slide, please? Thank you. So my last subject that I would like to talk to you about um, and put in perspective is the quality of life piece of cancer cachexia, the patient experience. So in our earlier time, we identified its impact to be principally related to physical functioning. And that was a deficit in the original consensus. Cachexia transforms vital, vigorous people into nothing in a short period of time, which is hugely impactful on the person. And the other gigantic impact is on their ability to enjoy the daily ritual of preparing and sharing food with family. This is an area under development at this time, and I would like to point out to you in my next slide, a very nice piece of work done also according to rigorous criteria, and it is the development of the cachexia related quality of life tool, the QLQ CAX24, which is a new instrument undergoing further validation, but it gets at these key things that we want to, to know to be able to assess our patients. What is distressing them about their weight loss as their body goes to a, an emaciated state? Um, what is the impact of the food intake on their feelings of, of well-being and their relationship with their family. And further, how does this wasting syndrome influence their course and their worry about the loss of autonomy? So if I may go to the last slide, please. I guess this is my point. Dyscachexia was broad, 
and based on concepts in large part, it had key important themes that have been pursued over time, and that is building and developing to further important information that helps us classify and develop diagnostic criteria for cancer cachexia. But you might agree with me, it is high time for version 2.0 of this effort. And I'm delighted to tell you that it is in progress under the excellent leadership of Drs. Fallon, Casa, Laird, Martin, Solheim, and Barakos. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Barakos. This was uh, a wonderful, clear, and informative presentation. It really shed light on the challenges, but also alluded to what we can achieve working with Cachexia. I was wondering if there are any questions from the audience. Let's see in the chat. Um, oh, there's many questions. Um, that's good. Um, do you know if we have been able to clearly mark uh, when the process of anorexia cachexia become irreversible, when pre is progressing to cachexia? Thank you. I, I think we need very important longitudinal trajectories to characterize the whole process from beginning to end. And we do not have that yet, but um, some people are, are developing it. It's it's very important because we have no idea of what it is pre cachexia and its final and potentially refractory stages. Um, we, we do not have any indices of that. Very important. Uh, one more question. Do you have any recommendation in how to manage cachexia? Oof. It's a tricky I one. Say, I would say that very simply. You will find my name on two clinical practice guidelines. One is the SPEN guideline on uh, nutrition in oncology, published 2017. And the other one is the ASCO guideline for management of cancer cachexia, and, and which, which just published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. If you compare and contrast these guidelines, um, it will be an interesting lesson for you. And it really underscores how much more work we have to do in, 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 in the other part of this, which is developing a body of rigorous, high quality evidence in order to be able to to have the evidence to care for people with cachexia. That's the real problem. There's not enough evidence and that which there is, is of remorsefully low quality. Thank you very much. And thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, we'll have to move on because we have so short time slots here to the next speaker which is uh, Barry Laird. Uh, he will discuss a bit more about how to find new evidence for treating cachexia. Oh, oh, oh. Barry Laird is a leader of um, palliative medicine at Edinburgh University and is also a consultant in palliative medicine at the Edinburgh Center, Cancer Center and St. Columbia's Hospice. He works to improve the symptoms of patients with limiting illnesses, partly by conducting these clinical trials. I've had the pleasure of working with Barry for several years, um, and we were brought together by our excellent mentors, Ken Ferrin, Mary Fallon, and Vicky Barakos, uh, and later through what became the PRC network. Um, it's now a pleasure to introduce Barry Laird, who will present a clinical, trial, clinical PRC study in Cachexia soon starting to be finalised. It's a real pleasure today to um, present at the, this PRC meeting to discuss the main act trial. My name is Barry Laird and I'm a reader in palliative medicine at the University of Edinburgh and I've been working on the main act trial and related studies for over a decade now. It's really is an exciting area to work in because 
the MENAC study really represents one of the first trials in, in of its kind which tries to improve treatment of cancer cachexia. Cancer cachexia is a condition which kills um, the vast majority of our patients. And, and as we speak today, there is no licensed therapy and no, sta and no standard of care available. What's interesting at the moment about how you know, we, we treat cancer and how we assess cancer is today we focus predominantly on staging the tumour and treating the tumour. You know, any of us who have been to cancer MDT meetings will note that we take a lot of time discussing um, the, the extent of the stage of the cancer, whether it's TNM stage uh, and also the detailed histopathology of, of any tumour. But yet we spend very little time staging the host. We may do a rudimentary assessment of performance status, but that can often be done quite badly and um, often inaccurately. So we don't really stage the host. We then really proceed to treat the tumour with you know, systemic anti-cancer therapies or indeed immunotherapies, but we really neglect to treat the host. So we really propose a new paradigm where as well as staging the tumour, we stage the host, as well as treating the tumour, we are treating the host. Now, the concept of treating cancer cachexia um, in relation to this present work was developed um, by my late colleague, Professor Ken Fearon, Professor of Surgical Oncology at the University of Edinburgh. And he published this paper in the European Journal of Cancer in 2008. And he suggested that cancer cachexia has a multidimensional genesis. And as such, due to this you know, multifactorial cancer pathophysiology, treatment needed to be multimodal where we targeted the key assets of this at the same time. He advocated that this would be high protein, energy dense nutrition. It would be anti-inflammatory agents to downregulate the acute phase protein response and also routine mobilization programs to prevent deconditioning and encourage physical activity induced postprandial anabolism. So this was a put forward as a sort of opinion piece in 2008. Um, on, on the basis essentially that if we were going to target cancer cachexia, we had to target the systemic inflammatory response, we had to target anorexia, and we had to target physical activity. The three key facets of cancer cachexia. So I'm pleased to say we've made some progress with this. Myself and my, and my other colleagues, including Tora Solheim and Professor Mary Fallon and, and Sven Kassa, um, amongst the other members of the team we see on, on the screen here, undertook a study called the PREMENAC study. This was a phase two feasibility trial of a multimodal intervention for people with lung or pancreatic cancer undergoing cancer therapy. So key to this was giving, giving people a treatment for cachexia, not after they had completed their cancer therapy, but alongside their cancer therapy because it, it's, it's hypothesized that the best way to treat cancer cachexia is alongside cancer therapies. So we took people with non-operable, non-small cell lung cancer or pancreatic cancer um, and enrolled them into a clinical trial where they had exercise advice, nutritional advice and also nutritional supplements. And also they took anti-inflammatories as well. This was a feasibility study. It wasn't designed to assess efficacy, but we were very encouraged by the findings um, from this. These um, were secondary endpoints. And what they looked at here was weight change and change in muscle. And if you can see here, the area in red is the treatment arm and the area in blue is the control arm. The control arm is essentially standard cancer care. And we observed that in patients in the treatment arm, there was a, a change in weight from baseline to week six, the end of the study, which um, seemed to occur more often than it did in the control arm. This finding was also complemented by changes in lean mass or measurement of muscle. And we also saw here in this that the patients in the, in the treatment arm had improvements in their muscle as well. 
So we were very excited that this intervention, which was exercise, anti-inflammatories, and EPA and rest oral nutritional supplements seemed to have beneficial effects on both weight and lean mass, thought to be key um, aspects of cancer cachexia. So based on these findings we, of the pre act study, which was the first multimodal intervention trial for cancer cachexia, where we met all trial endpoints, we moved forward in a phase three trial, which is currently ongoing. So as well as the sites we see in the UK, the MENAC trial is very much an international study where we have sites in both Norway, Switzerland, Canada, the UK, and also in Los Angeles. And we're very excited as the study nears its conclusion with 186 patients of our target of 240. What we are trying to do with the MENAC trial is improve clinical outcomes. We want to move from cachexia being seen as a symptom of late disease, moving towards a symptom that we should target early, almost prevention, treating cachexia before it develops. And we're also hopeful that this MENAC study will become the platform of which new agents can be tested on top of. It will become a platform study. So I very much hope that by the time the next PRC meeting's on, We'll be in a position to share some of these findings with you. Um, so I thank you for your time today and I look forward to the questions later on. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. I think perhaps due to the time we are going um, to the next presentation, um, and we will now see two very interesting abstracts. The first one will continue with the discussion for, on cachexia and is presented by Dr. Brady from Dublin, Ireland. It shows us uh, data from a study investigating the relationship between loss of skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle in patients with ossifugal cancer. The second abstract is by Dr. Arora from Bangalore, India, presenting data from a pilot observational study developing a cancer pain prognostication model. The abstracts will come right after each other, but then the two authors will answer questions in the chat. So please do participate also there to make this an interactive event. Hello, my name is Dr. Bernadette Brady. I'd like to thank the scientific committee for inviting me to present my research and the audience for their attention. I'm presenting a project entitled The Relationship Between Sarcopenia and Cardiac Muscle in preoperative esophageal cancer. I have no relevant conflicts of interest to disclose. Sarcopenia, the loss of skeletal muscle and function, is part of the cancer cachexia continuum. It's associated with morbidity and mortality, and those who have a diagnosis of cancer and are sarcopenic have a worse overall prognosis. What is less well understood is what happens to cardiac muscle in the presence of weight loss or sarcopenia. Loss of cardiac muscle may occur in tandem with sarcopenic loss. And we know that myocardial dysfunction, whether that be from intrinsic heart disease or associated with cardiotoxic chemotherapy, for example, can cause symptoms including fatigue and dyspnea. Cancer treatments may be delayed or discontinued due to poor performance status in both sarcopenia and myocardial dysfunction, and in particular those who have both. And this can lead to patients missing potentially curative treatment and having a worse overall prognosis. The aim of this study was to identify the relationship between sarcopenia and cardiac muscle size and function in a cohort of preoperative esophageal cancer patients. To describe our methods, I reviewed a database of all patients with esophageal cancer who had been referred to a national cancer centre, which is also a national referral centre for upper GI surgery, 
who were planned for treatment with curative intent over a five year period. The inclusion criteria for this study were that they had either a PET CT or CT plus an echo within 90 days of each other in the tertiary referral centre. The PET CT and CTs had been analysed for the presence and absence of sarcopenia and this data has been previously published. We analysed the echoes for cardiac muscle, size and function. We then calculated associations between the presence or absence of sarcopenia and myocardial function with the comparisons being tested using independent t-tests and calculated correlations of myocardial function with a skeletal muscle index using either Pearson or Spearman correlation coefficients as appropriate. The specific measures of myocardial function included those of systolic function, i.e. left ventricular ejection fraction, measures of diastolic function, including the E over A ratio, isovolumic relaxation time, and myocardial performance index, and measures of cardiac muscle size, including the left ventricular end diastolic diameter, the left ventricular mass index, and the posterior wall and septal diameters. I'm reporting the results of 48 participants, of whom 40 were male, which reflects the preponderance of males diagnosed with esophageal cancer. 42 had adenocarcinoma, with the remainder having squamous cell carcinoma. And the median skeletal muscle index was 57.5 centimetres squared over metre squared. For reference, sarcopenia is defined using the Prado definition as a skeletal muscle index of less than 52.4 centimetres squared over metre squared for males and less than 38.5 for females. In this cohort, 8 or 17% were sarcopenic at diagnosis. So when we compared the cardiac dimensions in the patients with and without sarcopenia, the results of note are that both groups demonstrated evidence of diastolic dysfunction with a reduced E over A ratio. So a normal E over A should be greater than one. In a group with sarcopenia, E over A was 0.86 and group without sarcopenia, E over A was 0.96. There was also a prolonged isovolumic relaxation time with normal being between 70 and 90 and the sarcopenia group had an IVRT of over 111. Of note also is that systolic function was not affected, with both groups having normal ejection fractions of 67 and 66% respectively. There was a significant difference in LV mass index and septal diameter between the groups with and without sarcopenia with these measurements being bigger in the sarcopenic group. When we correlated the cardiac dimensions with the skeletal muscle index, we didn't find any results of statistical significance, although the LV end diastolic diameter correlation with skeletal muscle index did approach significance. So, the summary of results shows that there was evidence of diastolic dysfunction in both groups, which was more marked in sarcopenia, despite normal systolic function. And this reflects the fact that due to the um, compensation mechanisms in the heart, systolic function can be normal for quite a length of time after cardiac dysfunction is present. LV mass index and septal diameter differed significantly in those with sarcopenia compared to those without. And both measurements were higher in the sarcopenia group. So this suggests that this cohort of patients had cardiomyopathy or hypertrophy rather than cardiac atrophy. I would suggest that all patients with cancer 
should have assessment for sarcopenia and cardiac status. This could facilitate identification and treatment of burdensome symptoms, avoid morbidity and improve overall prognosis. Again, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions in the chat box, or if you'd like to follow up with me afterwards, my email address is on the slide. Thank you. My name is Rahul, Dr. Rahul D. Arora, and I am from India. And the topic of my presentation is on development of a composite cancer pain prognostication model, a pilot observational study. These are my disclosures. The outline of this talk includes a discussion on cancer pain prognostication, a brief overview of the development and characterization of pain in advanced cancer, an observational trial, and development of a composite pain prognostication tool, a pilot observational study. The unique interpretation of a patient's pain experience, as well as many factors that may contribute to it, have impeded the development of a standardized classification system. The important questions which continue to remain unanswered include, should the same system be used for research and clinical use? Is the dynamic system better than a static one? And what is the impact of a classification system on patient care? And does it actually set out to meet the goals that it was conceived for? The process of prognostication can be divided into formulation and communication. The two ways to formulate prognosis are a subjective method based on clinician estimate of survival or actuarial analysis by way of models that predict survival. Prognostication is important to guide management decisions and to offer healthcare professionals greater clarity when communicating with patients and their families. The entire concept or the science of prognostication is based upon a simple question. Is it possible to quantify the dose of analgesia and the time to achieve stable pain control with some amount of certainty at the time of the first visit on the basis of characterization of pain using certain pre-specified descriptors, which include the mechanism of pain, the presence of neuropathic pain, the presence of incident pain, the presence of psychological distress, addictive behavior and cognitive dysfunction usually portend a poorer prognosis, which translates into a higher dosing of the analgesia or a longer duration to achieve stable pain control. The first version of the ECSCP included seven components and categorized patients into three groups, good, intermediate, or poor prognosis. In the evolution of ECSCP, you will see that it was found that the intermediate prognosis group did not have many takers, and so only good or poor prognosis were retained. Cognitive function and previous opioid consumption were removed after being identified to be unreliable factors in determining pain control. Cognitive function was reintroduced, however, tolerance was still excluded. The terminology and classification system for cancer pain was introduced, which reduced the number of features from seven to five and is retained as such. The first, pro the first study includes development and characterization of pain in advanced cancer and observational trial. It was an observational prospective study in an outpatient setting of the tertiary care cancer center, which includes palliative medicine referrals of mainly advanced cancer patients. 96 patients were screened and 85 met the inclusion criteria of moderate pain as well as an estimated survival of more than six weeks. The median morphine equivalent daily dose was 45 milligrams and the number of positive factors for poor prognostication of pain on ECSCP correlated with the modified equivalent daily dosage. Weak positive correlation was also observed between the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, the platelet lymphocyte ratio, and pain intensity, which did not attain statistical significance. The science of pain prognostication needs to incorporate an element of survival, and inflammation-based prognostic markers, were, such as NLR, PLR, and serum hemoglobin, were proposed as markers of chronic inflammation. The second study is the development of a composite pain prognostication model, a pilot observational tool. 
There have been numerous attempts to revitalize the concept of pain prognostication with inclusion of personalized pain goal and time spent during psychological liaison to better define the pre-existing construct of complexity or difficulty in achieving stable pain control on the ECSCP. The inclusion of biochemical and hematological parameters have been proposed as a means of redefining pain prognostication with an added emphasis on survival. A composite pain prognostication tool consisting of the ECSCP, the pain intensity or numerical rating scale, the NLR, the PLR, and biochemical parameters such as serum albumin and creatinine was administered to 215 patients with cancer pain. They were both in the outpatient as well as the inpatient setting, both early and advanced cancer patients, and over a period of three months. Neuropathic pain, presence of incident pain, psychological distress, absence of addiction and cognitive dysfunction were majority descriptors on the ECSCP. The mean med was 50.3 milligrams, whereas the cumulative med, which also included NSAIDs within its purview, was 54.3 milligrams. Nociceptive pain, presence of incident pain, and psychological distress were associated with a higher med. There was no statistical significance between med, NLR, PLR, and components of ECSCP. There was no statistical significance between MED and the use of adjuvant pain medications. Administration of available prognostic tools such as the PPI and the modified Glasgow prognostication scale in combination with ECSCP need to be considered if prognostication in terms of survival is to be measured. The current version of ECSCP may be more suited to the advanced cancer population and the inclusion of the early cancer patients and in patients and continuous intravenous morphine infusion may have led to a discrepancy in results. The future directions proposed by Dr. Stein Kassa on the evolution of ECSCP and the way forward include a need for providing training on concepts of measures and outcomes of pain, need for a agreement on the correct use of outcome measures, recognition that ECSCP can be used as a screening tool, a diagnostic tool, and for assessment in following up cancer pain, and need to be clear on the aims of clinical research surrounding the ECSCP and its usage. The same conference also threw up an important question. Is there a need for two versions, a clinical and a research pain classification system? Coming back to the question, looking at the evolution of ECSCP and given that and given that there are certain questions surrounding its, clinic, its clinical utility, it's important to ask whether the standard provision of ECSCP when it does not last more than five to 10 minutes and when all the prognostic factors can be determined at the time of the initial visit itself, is it clinically relevant? It has also been said that patients with more difficult pain syndromes can still achieve good pain control in almost half of the cases. Mod recent modifications to the process of pain prognostication include the inclusion of time spent by the interprofessional team on the daily basis and smoking history. Adding an element of determination of survival in the form of NLR, PLR, serum hemoglobin may add an extra, an extra element of survival and it might represent the chronic inflammation which can be used to correlate with pain severity characteristics and exacerbation and the uh, bigger question of patient survival. Uh, so thank you for your time and patience. Thank you both very much. That was indeed very interesting. Thank you all also for attending this seminar this morning. I would have loved to chat with you all now in the coffee break, but will we, that will have to be in the next upgraded year. So welcome to this session of the Health Services Research of the PRC Congress. And I hope you enjoyed until now this wonderful evening. Ev evening. Um, I'm Chris Fitzers and I'm a your chair of this session. I'm a professor in pain and palliative medicine in Nijmegen. And I thank also my co-chair, Marianne Hermstadt for the, from the Department of Oncology, Oslo Academic Medical Center. And we are co-chairing this first part of this session. Uh, this session includes PROMS and data outcome sets, which is very important, as stated yesterday by Kotman from Harvard at the Dunabedian cycle as a theory of quality improvement. 
outcome is the last step in your quality improvement program and it gives a strong interrelationship between the professional and the patient and what you together want to reach at a certain moment. We have three wonderful lectures, but I have to apologize for the first lecturer, who is Lenzo Robbins from Ghent University. He's a master in sociology, but he's at the moment, he's sick. And our next speaker, Kim Bernard, will take over part of his lecture and include that in her lecture. And the two lectures had the title, The Concept and Development of a Minimum Data Set in Cancer Palliative Care, Overview of the Literature, and Kim Bernard lecture about a new PRC project, Minimum Data Set of Quality of Life. Kim Bernard is a FEO postdoctoral fellow at the Ghent University and chair of the Palliative Care for People with Cancer Research Program at the End of Life Care Research Group of the Vrije University of Brussels with Luc Deliens. She has a master's degree in experimental and theoretical psychology and a PhD degree in social health sciences. Her PhD thesis has awarded the, the prize of the highest healthcare institution 2016 for the best PhD thesis in science and public health. Her main focus of interest is improving palliative care at the end of life care for people with cancer. She's also responsible for the research about improving the quality of care for babies and children with life-threatening conditions. We are very proud that she has time to lecture us during this wonderful meeting. Kim, the floor is yours. I can see it all. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Many of you uh, are clinicians who encounter or care for people with cancer, and you will ask them how they are doing, about their symptoms, etc. And at some centers, they ask it orally, or maybe they write it in the electronic patient file on a paper, paper and pencil, or in an app. And although some centers do it systematically or routinely, it often does not happen yet. Um, however, routinely assessment may be an important trigger to improve symptom management, to address other care needs of the patients, and improving the general quality of life uh, of the patient. And like uh, Irene Higginson and um, Professor Zimmerman yesterday told us, it can also be an important trigger when to start uh, palliative care or for a palliative care referral. Um, and as we also heard yesterday, this practice uh, um, needs research. Um, and there are also many researchers among you, um, and many have measured patient reported outcomes, as uh, we have seen in uh, Cynthia's presentations as well. And we have to um, and had to consider which tool you wanted to use, which items you want to use, how to use it, um, etc. And I think we lack, uh, or what we miss in research, is good longitudinal research. Uh, so a follow-up for a longer period of time, the patients with cancer. Also, international comparable studies are lacking. And what, what I'm involved in also recently is big data studies. But what we are missing in these big data studies is the patient-reported outcomes. So we can see what medication, uh, what treatments, uh, people got at, at at their end of life, but we cannot uh, relate it or, or associate it with their quality of life. And that are kind of the reasons why that lay at the ground of our project I want to present uh, today. You can go to the next slide. So uh, an overview of today is I want to show you the overall goal of our project, the emergence of the project and our project then and where we are now. Next slide, please. So we want to be able to routinely um, assess and collect a minimum of data on quality of life aspects of patients with cancer during their cancer trajectory and that we call a minimum data set quality of life. It would be nice to use it, these assessments for clinical practice, uh, so clinicians can use it at the individual level for, to address problems, care needs, to aid in decision making, etc. But it would also be nice to use it as a, for a research purpose. 
So we can collect uh, these patient uh, data and use it at an aggregated level to monitor, to use for monitoring longitudinal studies, linkage with other big data from um, administrative data or from ongoing studies, for example, and to make international comparisons. It would be nice if we can have kind of uh, the same minimum data set in multiple centers, wards, and I think therefore the PRC centers can be of uh, much value. Next slide, please. So as you have seen in Cynthia's uh, presentation and also a bit yesterday, this routine assessment is critical. So both at the individual level, it's good for the patient. At the institutional level, it's also important for centers to have a kind of monitoring to improve their care, see what can be improved, etc. And at the population level. Um, however, routine use of this quality of uh, life um, data sets, is, it's not part of the routine oncology care in a lot of centers. However, at some it is. Next slide, please. And that's why we recently started this project together with the PRC. So we already had this research idea in our end-of-life care research group and also together with our oncology research center at the, in Brussels, at the Vrije Universiteit Brussels. We were talking about it a lot, but not really do, doing something with it. And then in June uh, 2020, so it's quite recently, the PRC organized an online, online meeting on their new program. And where are we today and how we can uh, move ahead together was the title. And there we discussed um, which work packages PRC should focus on. Um, you can go to the next slide. And we came up with uh, seven um, work packages, let's say. And one of them was healthcare, health services research, and one is psychosocial, a new one, interventions for improvement of quality of life and quality of death. And I think this project relates a bit to, to both work packages and then with the participants that were there, uh, we made a minimum data set working group. You can see who's in there. Uh, so we started um, thinking about, okay, how can we go from what there is already to a minimum data set quality of life for international um, use? Next slide, please. And so we came to some project aims and plans, which I can present to you now, but like I said, it's quite recently. So the next slide, please. And we decided that the first step should be to explore what wards or what they are already doing. And we are looking, especially now for feasibility reasons and practical reasons at the PRC centers, what wards are already using some kind of prompt or minimum data set and for clinical practice or for research, what are they doing? What can we learn from them? What is asked? What is the process? What are the procedures to do it? Um, and then very importantly also, who uh, of the members of the PRC um, would want to participate in this project and want to think with us about how to continue further and how to make it possible because they're <laughs> like Cynthia, show there are a lot of challenges as well to, um, to develop and implement this. Um, so our first step would be an online survey we are now making for all PRC oncology and palliative care centers. Um, we would like to send it in the beginning of 2021. 20, uh, and um, yeah, we, we know that there is great expertise within this PRC center, so it would be nice that a lot of you participate in it. Next slide, please. And then a second step, I think that will be a difficult one as well, is um, we need to develop a feasible data set that everybody wants to use, clinicians that also researchers can do something with it and that it can be international comparable with each other. Um, and I think a Delphi method would uh, be working well there also with cancer patients included, expert clinicians, international researchers in the field, and we should focus and agree on what domains should be included. Can we use a measure that already exists, adapted a bit or not? Um, 
So we work with flexible items or not. Um, how can we do it? How can we collect and store the data? Because if you think of it, it will be a huge data set of all these patients routinely collected data in different uh, patient centers. So there is a lot of logistic things coming with it. Also ethical, juridical questions needs to be solved. And then in a third phase, the next slide, please. We would call it a preparation phase or a pilot. Um, I think some or all participating centers, depending a bit on how much, uh, we should develop an implementation strategy for the hospitals or the wards that want to start with it. Um, and then we can use, of course, the experience and, and expertise of uh, centers that are already running such uh, minimum data sets collection um, or pre and we can prepare and pilot the new data collection. Next slide please. And of course in the future it would be very nice if we could use this data set for clinical practice, for patient and clinician symptoms, needs awareness, empowering patients to raise their issues, can be an aid for clinical decision making. But of course for us as researchers it would also be nice to see how we can link it to other administrative data, to effectively do some research, international, regional comparisons on quality of life uh, linked to some treatments or other interesting research topics. We can use it as an outcome variable for ongoing studies and for longitudinal studies. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for listening. So we go over in the program to uh, Professor Brinella Cinzia. She's a, a researcher, a senior researcher from the Fondazione ERCCS, Instituto Nazionale dei Tumori di Milano, Italy, and she's trained in statistics from the University of Padua and a PhD in palliative care. She lets talk, importantly, the numbers of patients, and she will give us a lecture on EPROMs. What's the current status and what are the possibilities of the future? Cynthia, the digital floor is yours. Hello, thank you uh, to have been invited to, to give this uh, presentation on the current status and what are the future possibilities of electronic patient reported outcome uh, measurements. I do not have any conflict of interest to disclose. So I would like to, uh, to start from the very beginning. Uh, once upon a time, there were, in the middle 80s, quality of life questionnaires, which were developed to assess treatment outcome in medical research, and, uh, and also in, uh, in, in cancer research specifically. They represented a widening of the perspective from quantity to quality and uh, a, a change from a physician-centered assessment to patient-centered outcome assessment, which was also one of the first steps towards patient-centered medicine. Later on, we also saw a wide improvement in the methodological quality of the tools we were using. We now do have standards for the development and for the quality assessment and the validation of uh, patient-reported outcome measurements. We also saw a wide and exhaustive production, and we nowadays have a variety of tools. It's really difficult uh, not to find the right tool for the right patient that we want to use in our clinical practice or research. We also saw a, a change in the terminology, which is meaningful in my opinion. We started from the very attractive quality of life uh, terminology, uh, to the more appropriate uh, health-related quality of life, more specific one, and then to the finally most appropriate one, which we are using now, which is the patient-reported outcome measurement and uh, patient-reported outcome experiences. This is a, one of the last entries. More recently, uh, we started to study patient-reported outcome assessments as interventions per se. We have now evidence, quite wide uh, body of evidence, showing that, uh, that uh, pa routine patient reported outcome measurements uh, have positive impact on symptom control, patient well-being, cost effectiveness, patient engagement, and even survival, if, uh, even if we could discuss about this last outcome. But we, we do know that the, the outcome is positive. 
And then it is, last but, last but not least, routine symptom screening is actually a key element of integration of palliative care and oncology. And I believe all of us uh, agree upon this. However, due to barriers at various levels, Systematic patient reported outcome collection is not widely implemented in routine oncology practice. Th th this is a matter of fact. Barriers uh, are at different levels. They are, you can find barriers at institution level. You need resources to do this kind of uh, assessment. Rel barriers related to clinician. Uh, clinician must be, in, clinician mainly oncologists might, must be more engaged in this uh, assessment processes. Patients need also to be motivated and, and they have may have problems in filling in with these questionnaires. And in the end, we may have also barriers related to the instruments itself. In particular, the, the, the instruments were developed as paper and pencil tools. And, uh, and this is probably one of the reasons why they had difficulty, difficulties in being applied in uh, uh, clinical practice every day. And so what, uh, what, what happened is that we have seen a, a development of electronic patient reported outcome measurements, uh, which now we know uh, being uh, valid and reliable. They are valid mainly because we are actually using the same tools we were using paper and pencil, and these were valid tools. But they are reliable also because now we do have a body of evidence uh, showing that uh, the electronic assessment are actually producing scores which are equivalent to the paper and pencil collected ones. These kind of tools also allow, with respect to paper and pencil, allow distant follow-up, which is very important to uh, assess uh, patients' well-being in between visits, for example. They also uh, facilitate the interpretation of, uh, of the scoring, which was another difficulty uh, for these tools to be applied in clinical practice, because they allow automatic scoring and, and easy and automatic scoring, and also graphical presentation with time trends to clinicians. And then in the end, they allow efficient standardized assess assessment of massive data collection and uh, in the era of big data, this is very important because they also allow integration with all these patients with other patient data from other sources. In the last period, we consequently saw a step increase in the number of electronic patient reported outcome systems. These are some of the reviews uh, very, very recently published showing this step increase in the tools uh, in, uh, which are published in the literature, which actually will be a, an underestimation of the number of tools actually available on the market, because not all of them are published in the literature, in the medical literature. What, uh, what are the results of this review? Well, generally, these tools are very well accepted by patients and clinicians because they have been developed actually to be user-friendly. And, uh, and they also prove to be feasible. At least they proved to be feasible in this uh, research setting where the, the feasibility was studied. What other achievements did, you, did we have reached in this uh, with electronic patient reported outcome, outcome assessment? First, all, I would say all the tools uh, guarantee security and confidentiality of data. It could not be differently, obviously. Most of them uh, allow remote monitoring, not, not all of them do. Also, many uh, allow real-time graphical display of the results to the clinician, which is very important for the use in clinical practice, and uh, a part of them also have alerts for uh, uh, above threshold values. When patients uh, provide the high values, the clinician is, uh, is alerted on this. And then some of them provide also feedback for patients, and in some cases also self-management self recommendations. But still we, have, uh, we are facing challenges and uh, we, we can do something more in the future for development. For example, this is, in my opinion, one of the most important issues, which is the integration with the electronic medical record. Uh, 
uh, most of the tools developed uh, and present in the literature actually are self-standing tools. I mean, uh, the clinician to use the, the uh, to, to see the score uh, provided by the patients have to log into a different system and to look for the patient and then look into the data. And this may not be the best for clinical practice. We all know that the uh, clinical practitioners are very, very busy and, they, and, and this uh, uh, assessment should not slow down the process. They should enhance it. So the integration with the electronic medical record is, in my opinion, one of the most important things we have to do to push the use in clinical practice. On the same side, also, the patient experience should be facilitated, and if uh, uh, we have patient portals, the electronic patient reported outcome assessment should be integrated with them. And this is another issue. Most of the tools you find in the literature are uh, based on a limited set of questionnaires or items and are fixed on that. Uh, on the other side, in my opinion, I believe we should offer clinicians and stakeholders in general the possibility to choose the tool that better fits uh, their own aims. So the system should be uh, able to adapt to the needs of the users, and so which means to, to be able to, to, to assess different questionnaires. And then if we think about clinical decision support systems, uh, I believe they should be integrated also with that so that clinician can provide the treatment recommendation, which are also based on uh, uh, patient self-assessments. Uh, then when we come to implementation from theory to practice, uh, well, it, it is uh, uh, easier said than done, actually. So, what uh, we do need when we decide to implement a, um, a patient-reported outcome assessment uh, system, a systematic patient-reported outcome assessment system, we need implementation strategies. We need to understand which tools to uh, administer, who has to do the administration, where we have to do this administration, and, uh, uh, and mainly we need to um, do that to, to, to clear, clarify to the clinician which action to take when specific uh, uh, levels are uh, um, when the patient pro provide the ask for um, reports high level of symptoms for example so my the issue is what what does a clean an oncologist have to do when the patient reports anxiety level nine or on a zero to ten uh, rating scale so the, the the process the pathway needs to be clear to them for them to use it effectively this is also very important in the implementation process. We need to engage stakeholders. I don't mean only clinicians, but on also patients, obviously. We have to make them understanding that uh, patient reported outcome assessment is not paperwork. It's something that is going to very likely improve the care they are provided. And we also have to involve other uh, stakeholders like uh, policymakers and, and those who pay because we need for them to understand that in the end, in the long run, this kind of uh, uh, practices are going to uh, help us uh, saving also money and resources. And then, then we come to the, the research because uh, we said that these methods allow uh, the possibility to collect huge amount of data how we'll be using them. Uh, well, the integration with data warehouses uh, uh, in the institutions is very much important because uh, um, this is the only way we will be able to analyze appropriately all this data. And also regarding data reusage, um, I believe we should uh, uh, consider the potential ethical issues and the problem of asking informed consent for a different use of the data. I believe on this sense, not only for patient reported outcome, uh, we should better explore the uh, concept of data donation instead of uh, um, informed consent to data usage. But this would be another topic, not for this morning. So it seems that we are ready for electronic patient reported outcome assessment. There is evidence of clinical relevance. There is the attention of the scientific community. There is a widespread technology availability. Many people all have, do have their own uh, smartphone and uh, we should be able to, we should put in place systems that uh, allow us, allows us to use them. 
and uh, and also digital literacy which is one uh, we are aware that not all patients are able to uh, to do to fill in these tools totally by themselves but uh, actually i believe this we know that digital literacy is good and mainly and mostly it is expected to improve in the future so we have to be prepared to what will how it will change so what we have to do is just to do it this is an interesting paper published a few years ago, which called for an increase in the routine uh, patient reported outcome collection. Uh, it, it, the title was nice. It says we have to put patient reported outcomes on the big data roadmap. And the reason why we should do this is uh, that we should maintain the achievements of, of the 80s. Uh, otherwise, we will lose the uh, patient centered approach to care because if we don't have the what I would call promix, I believe uh, we are missing something. We are having research and new developments not based on uh, on the patient perspective. In fact, we hear a lot about big data, comparative effectiveness, machine learning, rapid, rapid learning healthcare systems. Um, I believe that uh, uh, in the future, uh, not probably not very next future, but in the future, what is uh, likely to, to, to happen is that we will see a change in the way we are uh, doing research and in the way we are consequently treating patients, because uh, it will be very likely that we will improve in our possibility to predict uh, uh, treatment response and uh, to um, understand uh, it, in which subgroups of patients uh, the response is better than the other. So uh, we can uh, drive our uh, treatment choices depending on the new knowledge. But uh, if, uh, uh, as I said before, if we want to uh, allow the big data to um, uh, to uh, add, to be added to this, uh, sorry, if we don't allow the, the patient reported outcome to be added to the, the big data issue, I'm afraid we are uh, going a step backward to the 80s as before. And uh, I believe we should do this. We should put in place ways to collect systematic, uh, high quality uh, patient reported outcome assessment, because only in that way we will be able to treat our patients and not only their cancer. Thank you. Um, thanks for two very nice and excellent presentations. I see. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Kim for taking on an extra presentation on such a th short notice. Very well done. And I think you have raised two very important uh, po um, points on two very important issues: the need for a uniform and agreed upon data set. It's much needed. Uh, even if there is one, it needs to be be improved, in my opinion. As far as I can see, there are no specific questions related to uh, your presentation in the um, uh, chat. Actually, here there is one. Uh, there is um, a question. Can we join this project despite we're not a part of the PRC centers? I guess you can respond to that, Kim. Uh, yes, I think so. It would be nice. We started from the PRC because this is a group we know that, that have a lot of expertise and we want to participate as it is also a PRC project. But of course, if other people are interested or they can send an email. <laughs> I think that's a very good good approach. It's always nice to, to include people from all over the world, actually, if they are uh, willing and yes. able to, to collaborate. So yes, yes, I agree with you on that. Uh, and then there are quite a few questions for uh, Cinzia. Uh, actually, there is one from my co-chair, Chris Visers. Isn't it most important to integrate EPROMs in the electronic medical record system of the healthcare professional? The export to warehouse should always be secondary. And I really agree to that. I think um, um, when it's not in the electronic patient records, it, can, it is cumbersome to use if you have to log on to a different computer that's outside the hospital networks, etc. I mean, all extra fuss reduces the use, which again reduces the evaluation of patient reported outcomes. Uh, any comments on that, Cinzia? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um... 
Uh, I believe th this is one of, the, for example, we have a, a pilot study in our institution and uh, uh, we made this choice to have uh, the patient reported outcome assessment uh, embedded into the electronic medical record. And uh, it took quite a lot of time, a lot of time to do this. Uh, we found a way of uh, not exactly to have the data within the electronic medical record, but to be seen very easily from within the electronic medical record. So in our institution now, the clinician opens the electronic medical record on a patient and he has a button which is called PROMS, Patient Voices is the project, and he can see immediately uh, the, the, the historical data on the of patient reported outcome by the patient uh, within that um, ambulatory clinic, for example, but also past uh, different questions fielded by the patient uh, uh, in other studies within the hospital. So we managed to do this. Uh, actually, not very many of the system available in the market do that because it's not easy. <laughs> it's quite complex. And uh, sometimes uh, you have uh, problems of uh, privacy or also uh, IT issues uh, which are difficult to deal with. But I believe we should go towards that. We cannot imagine that the clinician uh, uh, loses his very precious time to do something that uh, I have to say by now clinicians, they are not so happy about the need of uh, using patient report. What, 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 when I go and present the clinician my project, they say, oh, quality of life again, it, uh, it failed the, the promises of 20 years ago. I, I always answer them that it, it's not quality of life. They do not have to think about these very difficult tools to, to understand because uh, they remember these uh, paper and pencil, pencil things which were difficult to score and uh, a score of 27.8, which was changing to uh, 29.2. Well, what does it mean? Uh, nothing. <laughs> How do I use it, it in my clinical practice? So I believe the integration with electronic medical record, which uh, would uh, simplify the procedures for sure. And uh, the use of these uh, uh, graphic techniques and the fact that we know so much about uh, cutoff levels and uh, minimal important uh, different changes, uh, we know a lot from the theoretical point of view on patient reported outcome. And we can put this, all this knowledge now uh, at the service of clinical practice. So this patient is actually improving over time and, uh, and this can be used in decision making. The patient can, be, uh, can participate in the decisioning. Uh, the patient can also, if also the patient has the possibility to see the results, uh, also the patient can better understand what was his pathway, how things have changed, and so he can better participate in deciding uh, uh, whether to go on with a certain treatment or change to something else, if, if this is the decision. So I believe these are the two issues, uh, the uh, engagement and the making it is as, as easy and simple as possible. I just have a very short question before I proceed with the uh, ones in the chat. You said that um, in your pilot study, uh, the electronic e or the EPROMs weren't exactly in the EPR. Uh, what do you mean by that? How is uh, the patient report? How is the patient report documented then in the chart for later use? Yes, it is in the sense that uh, um, they are not within the, 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 the database. They are in a different server. Actually, they are not within the electronic medical record. Also, because there were. Uh, legal issues, uh, the patients are not allowed to write into the electronic medical record, right? okay? So we don't have the data in the electronic medical record, but we have the electronic medical record who, which allows the clinician to see real time the prompts, uh, which is what we need actually. And then the clinician can, uh, can have a a report, a text report, and if he believes that the report is okay, he can also take this report and put into the, uh, the, the, the his uh, report of the day. So uh, we choose this, this uh, possibility. The data are not within the database, but they are linked with the data warehouse and uh, all the other databases in the institution. Mm -hmm. uh, then there is uh, a question about the big data. How to jump on the big data wagon with the prompts? 
you were mentioning the big data yes. in your talk. So I, I, I think so. It's important. Promix, I call them, uh, because uh, I believe that if we don't, uh, but we. To, to come to the big data, which we all agree it's important, otherwise we will be missing the patient in these new uh, developments, okay? So I believe we all agree on the rationale to have this. How can we get there? And we get there only if we uh, pass through the uh, cl everyday clinical practice. If it, I remember uh, that I have always heard in my in my <laughs> in my story here in the institute that if something is useful in clinical practice, then it is uh, high quality and useful also in research. Because if we believe that we can collect all this data only for the search, I'm afraid we will fail as we have failed in the last uh, 30 years. Because we have good tools since 25 years from now. And we are not using them, and they are not in the proms, in the, the sorry, in the big data. So we have to go through the uh, clinical, uh, routine clinical practice to have them uh, very widely used and very, and very high quality. Because this is, this is the other issue. If the patient is not uh, convinced that these data are uh, important. Uh, he won't feel in. If he will feel in uh, in a bad mood, or will ask the son or the or other caregiver to fill in. And we know that this is a risk of having low quality data, and uh, we cannot accept this. So all stakeholders must be involved in this, and everybody has to understand the value of what we are proposing. Then. Yeah. Thank you, Cynthia. So, Kim, for you, are any incentives being offered to improve patient participation? Because also patients are very overwhelmed by, by their story, by everything what happens in the clinic, in the oncological pathway. So, can you, can you still add something that Cynthia was telling about patient motivation in your research? Uh, yes, I, first I thought incentives in what way, but I, I think uh, it can be of much added value for the patients if they have some care needs uh, or symptoms even, and they cannot talk about it uh, with their physician or it's not collected or you don't see it's getting better or worse and we need to change uh, some therapy or we need to refer to other caregivers to help the patient will still have the symptoms and it maybe even get worse. Um, so I think it's an incentive for the patient, of course, um, that we see the evolution of, of care needs, the evolution of, of symptoms, and that we really can address what is necessary as a clinician or, or yeah, other um, people in the caring for this patient. Okay, thank you. Mariana, you can invite for the coffee break or other questions? Uh, I think I would like to, you know, squeeze in one more question for Cynthia, but we need a short answer this time. We have like a minute or so. <laughs> uh, what are your, thought, your thoughts on remote monitoring of patient symptoms like telemedicine, you know, from outside the hospital or elsewhere? Uh, we are mobile phone apps. And things like that. Will this form part of routine practice in future? In the future, along with the prompt? This is what we expect, uh, and this is the, the, the final—not final, because I don't know what will come later on. But uh, um, I believe this. We have to aim to this. Now, many of the systems are based on uh, tablets uh, to fill in uh, in the hospital because of the limitation I told you. But the, the, the real future is that uh, everybody uses his own device because this, the experience needs to be simple, simple. Otherwise, patients, uh, they won't follow it. I Adding to that is the fact that more and more patients are treated as, as outpatients. So it will be nice to monitor from a distance. Yeah. Okay, and then I will take the, the opportunity to invite you all to a virtual cup of coffee or tea for that matter. Thank you for a very interesting uh, session and good presentations. Thank you all. Thank you all. Hello everyone. I am happy to welcome you back again to this uh, topical lecture. And I will now introduce uh, Professor Augusto Caracene. Uh, he is the Director of Palliative Care, Pain and Rehabilitation at Instituto Tumore in um, Milan, Italy. 
And we have had the pleasure to work with uh, Augusto for many, many years now. He, is, um, he has uh, an extensive publication record, both with um, respect to neurology, palliative care, papers, and books. Uh, today, he has a topical lecture on the subject of including palliative care patients in early clinical trial trials. So, Augusto, we're very interested and eager to hear this talk. Please. Thank you, Marianne, for the introduction. Thank you for offering me the opportunity to participate in this PRC seminar. The topic is relatively new for me, but I hope it will be interesting for you. So I would like to start sharing my screen here and uh, starting from the beginning. Uh, this uh, my presentation is also a conjunct effort with the Innovative Partnership for Action Against Cancer, which is a joint action of the European uh, Commission and the European Union. Uh, so the scope of the presentation is to give you a, an idea of uh, uh, what is the relationship and uh, the concept of integrating uh, palliative care and oncology in the specific case of early phase oncology clinical trials and phase one trials in particular. A uh, secondary aspect is also to present you a new project of the PRC where we would like to work on this topic together with oncologists at an institutional level. Well, just to summarize very briefly, you know that phase one trials or early phase trials are trials where uh, newer therapeutic agents that are unknown toxicity and efficacy are first tried on patients. Efficacy is therefore never, never a primary aim of these studies. And patients who failed available first-line treatments are usually enrolled in this trial, although somehow the picture of this is changing nowadays. However, uh, certainly some of these uh, characteristics uh, fits also patients that, uh, in case this type of trials are not available, would uh, uh, potentially be referred to piety care. It is also true that newer therapeutic agents have had the significant therapeutic responses in phase one trials. This is, a, I gave this number, which I heard about, it be, can be debatable. There are very famous cases of, of drugs for non-small lung cancer, uh, published in 2014 uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine, where a very strong uh, therapeutic response was found. However, it is also true that uh, uh, these patients uh, uh, they face a very particular uh, situation. So what we decided to do is to see if there is any literature basis uh, addressing uh, the topic of uh, this topic uh, about uh, the relationship, uh, the, the conflict or the potential of collaboration in between uh, palliative care and uh, enrolling patients into early phase and particularly phase one uh, clinical trials. So at the stage where we are at now, we did a literature search uh, with the usual uh, system. It still needs to be refined and completed. We identified uh, among uh, a few hundreds of selected papers, uh, a number in between 24 and 30 papers, which we are now analyzing and also refining the literature search to make it more specific and more uh, comprehensive as much as we can. So I'm sharing with you an initial uh, glance at this uh, review uh, where I tried to identify the topics that are coming into this uh, uh, into the available literature, which uh, can be indeed interesting for our uh, goal of uh, addressing the integration in between oncology uh, specialty and palliative care specialty. Certainly there are ethical issues. And indeed, in general, uh, somebody would expect that uh, patients are not denied appropriate care by the fact of being involved in uh, clinical trials. A uh, second aspect, uh, which is uh, often present in this literature, is uh, the role, the potential, and the scope of uh, uh, goals of care discussions with patients. As we said, the appreciation of the scope of the trial and uh, the potential uh, uh, lack of uh, uh, benefit uh, from the point of view of controlling the disease, side effects, 
prognosis, symptom burden, all of this is within uh, a, a critical situation in the case of these patients. Informal consent and communication is also very important, as we said, because of the peculiar uh, um, context that, that these trials uh, do have. Um, second uh, interesting topic, uh, there is consensus that uh, the palliative care needs that are assessed, that are uh, uh, empirically uh, found in uh, this group of patients are certainly high. So as far as symptom control, quality of life, the need of psychosocial support, which in terms of emotional distress sometimes is peculiar of the situation of the trial, being in the trial the expectations that are put within the trial and the potential uh, uh, dismay of these expectations uh, in case uh, the disease uh, uh, progresses as it often does. Advanced care planning, of course, is uh, one aspect, and spiritual care also. So we have seen that this is coming through the literature, these specific literatures, several times. One more specific aspect is to look at if we can uh, uh, document any impact of uh, the enrollment in early clinical trials, phase one in particular, but as we said, and this is a topic to discuss probably in a working group, uh, the uh, different uh, nuances that now these trials can have. But however, uh, the referral criteria to palliative care, should the palliative care be as a rule already in place when uh, these patients are enrolled in the trials? For instance, uh, uh, ASCO clinical recommendations uh, would uh, probably fit with uh, uh, giving these, these patients uh, uh, the opportunity to enter trials, uh, to enter palliative care at the same time, in a simultaneous way. Patient expectations are very important, and they may be influenced by concepts that have been described several times in the literature when patients are involved, either objective impacts or subjective impacts associated with the expectations of the patients. Uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, this is documented further by uh, the uh, experience that patients enrolled in phase one clinical trials, so they have uh, uh, less awareness of the needs uh, that they may have uh, towards palliative care, towards uh, uh, symptom control, even when symptom burden is uh, comparable with patients not enrolled in uh, trials. And also sometimes, at least in some uh, published experiences, uh, a perception that perhaps these patients may have a relatively low of referral to uh, palliative care uh, in comparison with other type of patients. Again, uh, the same uh, uh, discussion goes on in uh, uh, other papers uh, where uh, the uh, uh, ability to use palliative care services can be put at, uh, uh, as an alternative to the enrollment in a clinical trial. But the question is, are the criteria for patients to be enrolled in clinical trials the same to access, for instance, hospice? Superficially, sometimes yes, at least from this point of view of the stage of the disease, having had uh, uh, most of available cancer treatments uh, and so forth. But certainly uh, performance uh, is often a difference. The performance to be included in clinical trials early phase is certainly usually uh, better, much better than for patients to access hospice uh, and even uh, in general uh, palliative care, maybe. But certainly uh, the Prognosis, uh, uh, in case patients are not going to have uh, a therapeutic response, uh, uh, is uh, similar. And the potential for worsening uh, while the trial is progressing is also very high. So we should ask the question, how can we bridge these needs uh, with access to appropriate services? Is uh, the uh, access uh, to services during the trial uh, something which makes the, the, the patients exit the trial, is this appropriate or can we continue with the trial requirements also under palliative care service uh, uh, management? Uh, my personal observation about sponsoring companies uh, is uh, an, a, a side observation, if you want, because I be strongly believe that uh, 
uh, some of the uh, uh, reimbursement that uh, institutions get for performing trials, they do not include palliative care uh, interventions. In my hospital, sometimes they cover for pain therapy uh, interventions and not always in all the negotiations with pharmaceutical companies. And I think this uh, is a problem. Uh, then if we move to other type of evidence from qualitative uh, uh, data, but very interesting data, uh, interviewing in this paper from the UK patients included in early clinical trials, phase one clinical trials in particular, uh, it was interesting uh, to uh, read in the patient uh, words that they indeed have a low perception of uh, political need, that they have uh, the idea that palliative care is only end of life care, which may be a common uh, belief uh, also out of this uh, context. Certainly they have high psychological distress, which is also associated with the trial condition. Interestingly enough, some of them were already engaged in palliative care before entering the clinical trial had indeed a better coping with the palliative care concept per se and in how it could be integrated with the trial conditions. And uh, uh, in some cases, also the fact that uh, being uh, participating in a clinical trial may be felt some, somehow conflictual with uh, or inconsistent with uh, the concept of palliative care or accessing palliative care. In the same uh, study, also very interesting, the conclusions about uh, uh, formulated by the patients about palliative care per se. Uh, the concept that they thought that it would be uh, important to introduce palliative care specialists earlier on, before even the trial uh, access, uh, that they lack information about the palliative care, and they certainly would like to see a better uh, picture a more positive picture of uh, palliative care as it is being discussed also in previous presentations uh, at this uh, uh, conference. Uh, what else in the literature? Are there interventions that have been tested in uh, patients uh, uh, participating in clinical trials, in particular in early phase clinical trials, uh, as far as uh, palliative care interventions uh, are uh, con concerned? We found only one clinical trial that has been uh, out for a while now. Betty Farrell uh, is the principal investigator uh, in, of this uh, uh, trial, where they tested a particular intervention for patients uh, specifically admitted to uh, phase one uh, uh, studies. So the inclusion criteria uh, to access either the intervention or to be randomized to the control group the inclusion criteria was uh, to be uh, included in a phase one clinical trial. All sorts of cancers were part of the trial and the intervention was uh, defined as it is described in this slide. So the palliative care intervention, I think, uh, is another very interesting issue here, uh, which has uh, an overall meaning beyond the trial, I would say. When we talk about palliative care integration with oncology, what are we talking about? I think we should now be specific and be clear about what we uh, intend. In this trial, the intervention was a nurse-led, the study nurse-led intervention, where the nurse was uh, making a, a care plan based on the baseline patient evaluation. There was one interdisciplinary meeting to discuss the patient uh, with nurses, chaplain, social worker, and the oncologist was invited to this meeting when possible. If not possible, the oncologist was told the meeting results. And the discussion included assessment of the patient's understanding of the goals of care. Unfortunately, I cannot understand by reading the papers uh, if the patient was part of this meeting. Then the patient received indeed the two teaching sessions by the research nurse who used the standardized teaching materials uh, and so forth to help the patient uh, engage uh, in, uh, in his own uh, uh, progress uh, of uh, care. They randomized more than 100 patients uh, per arm and the follow-up was uh, for four weeks uh, and 12 uh, weeks. Uh, and the outcomes uh, were evaluated uh, on uh, uh, quality of life uh, using the FACT-G uh, FACT uh, questionnaire 
and the distress thermometer, and they found some positive effect uh, on uh, the intervention uh, arm of the study. Unfortunately, there was a strong center effect. Two centers were participating in this trial, one uh, on the uh, west coast of the United States uh, in uh, uh, California, and one on the east coast, uh, is, which is the John Hopkins uh, uh, Cancer Centers, Cancer Center. And uh, indeed, one of the center had much better result than the other. So this implies another significant uh, issue related to what we are uh, aiming at, what we are evaluating, and uh, the context uh, in which we are uh, uh, working, uh, both on the clinical side and on the research side. Interesting, the use of resources, which would be an interesting approach to this kind of trial, was uh, poorly documented because you see that there are auspices uh, which uh, may include also on care in the in the US uh, approach to this. In fact, uh, the inpatient hospice death you see are uh, below only 6%. And in fact, uh, it's uh, uh, a problem to see that uh, the place of death is unknown in more of than half the patients enrolled in this trial. Another trial which we found, uh, uh, which may be related to the area of, of our area of interest, but more tangentially, I would say, is this one of an, the educational intervention. You see that the wording is also interesting because they are talking about simultaneous care and uh, linking palliation with an educational intervention. So forth, the educational intervention is defined in the trial it has to it is an intervention uh, addressing uh, the diet a dyadic intervention addressing patient and caregiver in a way to help them to cope with the situation in a home care situation and so we i don't want to go into the details they are using a follow-up of uh, 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 six months as you say and uh, they are uh, randomizing patients towards the intervention and out of, of the intervention uh, there is not no significant result from the intervention, but just to speculate uh, about again what it is an intervention, what are the tools to evaluate the intervention, uh, etc. When we want to address uh, an integration in between uh, a, a palliative care approach uh, and uh, uh, clinical trials. Uh, one of the interesting articles that we found is this article, which I think is a sort of small. Uh, starting points, more landmark for this uh, project that we have, which indeed uh, address from a general point of view the concept, uh, uh, publishing the results of a consensus uh, meeting of several institutions you see across uh, Europe uh, and the United States, uh, Switzerland uh, and uh, uh, Spain are uh, there, and some of the colleagues uh, that uh, are part of the panel are well known and also participating in our own uh, group research group. Uh, you see the title is already quite uh, uh, suggestive of uh, a debate uh, between what it is potential for collaboration or, or even antagonism. And I quote uh, a couple of, of uh, sentences from that, which I think is interesting because indeed uh, one would expect that uh, uh, colleagues uh, do not uh, uh, discourage patients uh, to uh, entering uh, trials for just for ideological reasons. And on the other side, also expect that uh, patients uh, are not uh, uh, persuaded to go on in trials at the detriment of uh, good clinical care. A phrase also in the discussion is quite interesting, which uh, I found uh, a little bit disturbing from my point of view, considering that colleagues uh, from both sides of uh, the specialty were involved, because uh, this concept uh, of uh, also the language is a little, uh, from an English language point of view, I think is uh, interesting, based on my ignorance of English, but I found this uh, adverb staunchly quite uh, a nice word. So if you say that, uh, I would add to that that uh, uh, if uh, uh, oncologists would be uh, uh, discouraging patients uh, to access palliative care or uh, uh, poorly uh, uh, evaluating the palliative care uh, goals, uh, probably uh, oncology is not the right specialty for them to add a sort of uh, 
counterintuitive uh, 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 sentence about that. So integration is certainly based on collaboration. And uh, it is interesting that this uh, uh, paper where by interviewing, by interviewing the, the multidisciplinary groups at NIH in Bethesda, so colleagues from Piety Care and from oncologists, oncology, uh, they all uh, agreed that uh, a standard of an acceptable model for integrating uh, the two specialties concurrently in clinical trials is still needed and not yet developed. For all these reasons, uh, I think it would be interesting to develop a project within the PRC using the evidence that we are being reviewing into the literature uh, to uh, uh, clarify a number of topics. You see some of them uh, uh, summarized in these slides and uh, we in a, in a systematic uh, way and uh, by building a consensus group between uh, uh, one pediatric care and one oncology uh, association or institution. And my proposal and the proposal I'm working with with friends uh, and uh, collaborators already is the following. We have now a working group uh, in Milano based on one uh, pediatric care uh, fellow and PhD student at my unit, one uh, phase one trialist delegated by the uh, Department of Oncology. Uh, Stein Cosa, as a chair of the PRC, is involved and he's uh, providing a phase one trial in Oslo. I would like to uh, now uh, open this uh, to the participation of other members of PRC to the working group. The systematic literature review is ongoing and the next step would be to propose a collaboration with the ESMO designated centers for integration of oncology and priority care to establish a group and to agree on uh, aiming at a position paper on this topic. And I thank you for the attention. Thank you so much, Augusto, for a very extensive um, presentation about clinical trial um, participation and palliative care. And then I'm happy to introduce the next speaker, Karin van der Riet, um, from Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. Uh, she has a long uh, clinical and research experience in palliative care, and her talk is about um, uh, the physician-patient dialogue in clinical trials and relates well to the uh, topic addressed by Augusto. Thank you very much, uh, Mariana, and thank you, uh, Augusto. I think you gave a perfect uh, introduction uh, to the topic, um, and it fits well, I think, with the start of my uh, presentation. Um, I uh, want to give a presentation on a running project, uh, and it's a, a, a multi-center uh, project in the Netherlands um, in patients who are treated or who are referred uh, for trial participation for an early phase clinical trial. Uh, my disclosures. Um, I'm uh, working in the uh, Erasmus MC and the Erasmus MC as a large cancer institute. I'm working in the Department of Medical Oncology and in that uh, uh, department there is a large unit for early phase clinical trials. Um, but we also have a research group and a clinical group on palliative care and in this project we collaborate. So the unit for early phase clinical studies and the palliative care group collaborates to see how we can improve um, things for patients who are referred for the studies. Um, as Augusto already told, I think early phase clinical trials are really important for uh, medical oncology. It, they are a prerequisite for the further development of uh, better anti cancer therapies. What we also know is the patients um, who participate in those trials do that because they have hope and they have belief. And as Augusto told, um, preparation for end of life um, is an important topic because 
patients themselves also ask less often for palliative care. Uh, they are afraid uh, sometimes to talk about uh, symptoms. Um, hospice care is less often offered. And we also know that decisional conflict is reported in patients um, who are treated in early phase clinical trials. And what we also know is in general, patients' attitudes uh, to treatments vary. There are patients uh, who really want to have a treatment even when there is a low probability that the treatment will be effective. And there are other patients who, who say quality of life is much more important for me. Um, what does that mean for the discussion between the medical oncologist and the patients? When patients are referred for early phase clinical trial, um, the discussion, I think, is rather difficult for medical oncologists. Um, of course, they have to give information about the aims of the study, about the technical aspects of the study. They have to talk about palliative care, at least in the Netherlands, the medical oncologist is also in, uh, uh, important for giving the palliative care. But it's also important that the patient's personal values and preferences are discussed to see whether this is really important for the patient to participate. Nowadays, the early phase clinical trials are getting more and more complex. So in the first discussion about the study, it's really difficult for medical oncologists to have enough attention for the values and preferences because of the discussion of the studies and the medical aspects of the study. What we hypothesize is that when you are able to better clarify the values of patients with incurable cancer, and especially the patients for whom the standard uh, 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 therapies are no longer possible, that you get a better patient-physician uh, communication, that uh, patients are better able to take a decision, that you have less patient decisional conflict, and that patients take a decision according to their own values. Um, in this project, um, we aim to achieve this goal with uh, an online value clarification tool, which we uh, wanted to construct and to test. And that tool uh, is called the UNFACT. In this project, we have two parts to work packages. Uh, first is the development of that online tool. And another part of the project is a study. It's a pre-post study on the effect of the implementation of the tool. Um, what about the development of the OMFACT, of the value clarification tool? Um, we started, and that was a part uh, that was done, especially in Nijmegen, uh, with members from the group of uh, Chris. Um, they started with a qualitative uh, study uh, with interviews and focus groups, uh, patients who were referred uh, to participate in an early phase clinical trial were interviews and some they were also interviewed after uh, several, several weeks after the first discussion to see what uh, was important for them, what were their values, what were their preferences. And with that information, uh, a tool was constructed um, and it was also technically tested with think aloud sessions to see whether people, whether patients were able to use and to understand the tool. Um, 
the first part is um, um, is, is is ready, um, and a lot of patient values were found. Um, some of them, I think, um, we could expect. So, uh, for example, that hope is important for patients. For other patients, they have altruism motives. They want to participate because they know that uh, with that uh, new compound, maybe in the future, uh, patients uh, can be treated. Um, other patients uh, told them that quality of life was more important for them than quantity of life. Uh, so there were uh, various uh, motives and some of the motives were important to, uh, to, to participate in a trial. Other motives were important to not participate in the trial. Um, uh, some motives could have, uh, for some patients, they wanted to participate, uh, but for other patients, the same motives were important not to participate. For example, uh, the care for the children. Some patients hoped then that they could longer care for their children and others thought that it would take too much uh, time to participate in a trial and they wanted to be more at home, for example. Um, what we did, um, uh, and it was especially a collaboration be, uh, between the researchers from the from the group of uh, of Chris Vissers with uh, a company Eisfontein, um, we made an online value clarification tool. Um, a patient who is referred for the trial um, uh, gets access to the tool, and he see a lot of other people. They they are walking around other people and those people tell them a story and the stories in the stories, uh, the themes from the qualitative interviews are embedded and with the tool we want uh, to achieve that patients are becoming more that they realize what is important for themselves and that that they this realization they are stimulated to talk about that with the medical oncologist um, so after referral of the patient the patients get access to the online tool and we hope that in the first consultation with the medical oncologist about early phase clinical trial participation, values of them, preferences of the patients will be better discussed. Um, we hope to prove that in the pre post uh, clinical study. Uh, I made a mistake, I think, um, uh, but it, it's a pre post uh, study. Three units for early phase clinical trials are participating. We aim to include 276 patients um, in this month. In December, the pre uh, part of the study will close. Uh, we included enough patients for the pre part of the study. Uh, we measure patient decisional conflict a few weeks after um, the first discussion with the medical oncologist um, and that's around the time that a patient decides whether he wants to participate uh, in an early phase clinical trial or not, whether he wants to be further uh, and then at that time he still doesn't know which uh, study but then the screening phase starts. Uh, what we also do is audio taping of the patient physician communication and um, we measure the shared decision making and we measure whether the patient's values and preferences um, are discussed. We did do that in the pre part of the study and in January we will start the post part of the study. 
to see whether the shared decision making and the discussion of the patient values and preferences um, will be uh, higher. Um, in the, the between the pre and the post part of the study, we will teach the medical oncologist from the three centers how to integrate the discussion of patient values and how to discuss um, what's important for them to take a shared decision. So in conclusion, communication about participation in early phase clinical trials is difficult. Uh, decisions should follow the values and preferences of patients as a really important part also of palliative care. Uh, we think that communication of values may promote the insights of patients and also of the physicians about patients' values. And we hope that we thereby then facilitate decision making also about such a difficult decision. Uh, whether or not to participate in uh, palliative care. And of course, um, I thank all the co-investigators of this project. Welcome uh, everyone to this uh, panel discussion. It's moderated by myself, uh, Stein Corsa, the leader of PRC and uh, Luke uh, Deliens. And the participants are uh, Augusto Caracene, Barry Lord, and Kim Bernard. So uh, we have planned to have some sort of structure here, uh, but we can also be flexible. So we are starting with so, some questions related to Kekexia. Then we will uh, go over to and discuss issues related to patient reported outcomes and patient preferences. And then uh, that might also lead us directly into uh, palliative care and early clinical trials. So the overriding question is how to improve the quality uh, and the impact of palliative care uh, research in the healthcare system in general as such, and specifically in, in cancer care. So um, I think I will start off and uh, ask uh, quest one question about uh, about cancer cachexia. Uh, we heard uh, Vicky Barakos uh, and we heard yourself, uh, uh, Barry, talking about uh, treatment. And, and uh, Vicky told us about, we, we need to look into who are these patients, uh, how, how to categorize them or, or how to classify them. So wh why is it so important? And, 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 and I wonder what should be the next steps? Uh, where, where can we improve uh, in the classification of uh, patients who are either in early or refractory or midstream cachexia? Yeah, thanks, Dain. I think, I think you raise a very a key point. I mean, really, although we have this very well respected and utilised consensus definition, this was designed as a, a starting point to be modified and changed. And to still to, to this day, we still don't really understand, you know, you know what cachexia is, the different stages of cachexia, you know, why somebody with advanced, why somebody with breast cancer gets cancer cachexia. Um, so it doesn't get cancer cachexia, whereas somebody with lung cancer does get cancer cachexia. Or, you know, why, how, how can a two centimetre tumour in a pancreas essentially, you know, decimate an 80 kilogram man? So we, st we still don't understand all this. And I think key research priorities, um, myself and Prof. Fallon and, and yourself obviously are working on is a detailed characterisation of, of, of patients with, with cancer cachexia, because it's clear there are, there are various stages. Some of the early stages we, we can't really see. Um, and that is, a, that is fundamental to underpin any, any research in research we do. So I think, you know, characterization and accurate phenotyping, I would say is, is you know, our first priority um, or the main priority, you know, moving forward with cachexia research. Okay. Um, are there any other comments or, or reflections from the panel on 
on uh, classification of uh, or cancer cachexia? I mean, okay, then uh, maybe we should, uh, we can come back to it later, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, look, uh, do you want to elaborate on some questions uh, related to patient reported outcome measures? Yeah, I have it. First of all, uh, thank you for the very interesting uh, presentations, uh, even with the uh, technological challenges during <laughs> the presentations, uh, quite some fun. Uh, but I'd like to, to go into the reality because uh, the group of uh, Mike Bennett recently published uh, in BMC Medicine a very interesting review on the duration of palliative care before death. Uh, coming out what we all know, that it's a very short uh, uh, term uh, from initiation of palliative care to death. Uh, it just was published just a month ago, coming out with 15 days for cancer patients and six days for non-cancer patients. And that was a review of over 100 studies. Uh, so my questions about routinely assessment, and we know that routinely assessment of quality of life in daily practice is not ideal in oncology, uh, even not in palliative care. So, but how could routinely assessment of uh, quality of life in daily oncology practice facilitate early integration of palliative care in oncology? And it's a very, very, very general question. So it's not only addressed to Kim Beenaert, but also Augusto or Karin or Barry could answer this question. So who, who wants to start? Okay, Kim. I can maybe start as it was my topic uh, for the presentation a little. Um, Yes, it's, it's, it's indeed a very short time and we have the same in Belgium. Um, and I think this is mainly still, uh, or the reason for this is still that people think about prognosis when they think about how or when should I start palliative care. So that's a problem. And I think um, there's much more literature and insight in that it should be needs based to start uh, palliative care. So then we can make the link, of course, to, to measuring patient reported outcomes and see if there are some needs that could be addressed by palliative care services. Um, at first, an oncologist or other clinicians that see the results of the, these prompts can have a look if they can solve it themselves and if they uh, and their team can solve the problems of the patients. And if not, there should be kind of an alarm bell uh, thinking about special to involve specialist palliative care. So I think in that way, it might help to to make the thought of referral to specialist palliative care earlier if necessary and see also exactly for what care needs they can be um, called up. Uh. Yeah, and, and I, I would just add, add to what, what Kim is saying that, you know, if you take cohexia, for example, an area where we haven't really focused on, on, on problems as outcomes, we're focused on, you know, up, up very much objective measures like muscle mass or, or weight or BMI. I think, you know, these, these haven't really delivered. So I wonder if in cancer cohexia, we're actually going to be moving towards, you know, patient reported outcomes of quality of life or appetite is actually you know, perhaps more more patient centred uh, endpoints and studies than uh, what we've traditionally been using. Mm -hmm. And I also want to add, if if I can, um, yeah. yeah. So it's one thing to measure it and that the clinician see what comes out of what the patient was reporting. But then, and there was also uh, some questions about it in the chat or so, like. What do you do? Is there an alarm bell? Is there a cutoff? It was also something uh, Professor Zimmerman was talking about yesterday, because that's the only way it will work. If if you really do something, what is coming out with it? And at what point should extra help be, be offered? And I think that's something research can go into a bit more as well. Could I, could I add on, uh, because uh, look, you, you were indicating, if I understood you correct, that uh, it's not done routinely in most clinics. So my question is, we know that it works in research. And why is it not implemented as a routine? And why is it not implemented into the decision-making process by the nurses and the doctors? It's not only 
the doctors, it's also the nurses, from my experience. So why the heck <laughs> can't, can't, can't we do it? Uh, Karen, do you have a comment on that? Um, I think it's really difficult. Um, I, uh, some years ago, I did a project on pain measurements, and at that time, it was not yet possible to do it online. Um, but we had a project in which every patient who visited the outpatient clinic was asked um, to assess uh, their pain on a computer, on a, on a separate computer, and the doctor uh, could see the results. And he got indeed an alarm uh, when there was a specific score. And during the project, it worked rather well. Uh, patients, uh, when asked, were enthusiastic. Uh, doctors, uh, when asked, said that it, it was a good idea. Um, but it took a lot of effort to get the patients to go to the computer. And at the moment, when we had no longer students to help them, um, it stopped working. Um, and that was only one symptom, pain. So when you want to measure more symptoms, it's even more difficult, I think. Um, so I, I do not have the answer. Uh, but what, what I see with my colleagues um, in medical oncology, we use the CTC scores and also in the CTC scores, you measure pain, you measure uh, vomiting, you measure nausea, that the CTC scores are rather well used when patients are participating in a trial. And in clinical trial, it stops. And I'm, I think, one of the, of, uh, one of the co uh, colleagues will really uh, answer the CTC scores for patients, uh, also uh, when they are not included in a trial. But it's rather difficult for my colleagues. Um, so I think, but also patients tell uh, tell you that. I do not want to be seen as a patient, and I do not want to answer every visit, uh, whether I have pain or other symptoms. So it, it's really difficult. Okay, uh, great. I think we need to move on, look to the next subject, because time is running short now. We have five more minutes. Out of time, uh, I'd like to go to Augusto's presentation. Uh, I had a very provocative uh, idea when you were presenting, uh, and that's about ethics. Uh, so normally it's an ethical approach to offer palliative care to advanced cancer patients. So if it's ethical to do that, why could, could we not explore uh, possibilities with ethics committees because all these phase one trials have to go to ethics committee. Uh, so what is the feasibility and maybe if you, whether you have found anything in literature that works through ethics committee as a kind of a referral to palliative care making a condition before entering a phase one trial. It's a very provocative idea, but did you understand my question and did you yes, find Yes, yes, I understood it. It's a provocative, but not excessively, I would say, if you want. <laughs> However, I can be more provocative if you want. <laughs> we don't need that. Now, uh, um, yes, I mean, it's already debated in the literature that we are looking at. So I think we can make this a, a, a focus on uh, this working group, for instance. Yeah. Uh, I have had also a personal experience uh, in the last years. Uh, the scientific direction of my hospital discussed with me the opportunity that uh, uh, palliative care uh, was or were engaged when uh, 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 phase one trials uh, protocols were designed and even to give some recommendations in general, because I think it would be enough 
also that uh, at least in the protocols, uh, the concept is taken into consideration that uh, at least in the protocols, there is a said that palliative care should be available. And that even uh, openly say that uh, palliative care should at least not be uh, denied because <laughs> I mean, maybe with a with a with a more careful language, but uh, because at times it seems that uh, the uh, conflict in between uh, uh, continuing uh, on the trial and the ability to uh, detect the particular needs or the moment where you can eventually stop the trial, etc., is uh, influenced by uh, the protocol conditions. So I think this is an ethical and a scientific uh, point. I agree with you. Could it be integrated into the informed consent procedure before the patients entering the trial? I can tell you that I've seen this uh, debated. I've seen this in, in the available literature. Uh, somebody says uh, it should be uh, even more than that. They even say that the uh, palliative care team should be part uh, of the informal consent process. It's, uh, but it, it is in the, in the era of a sort of, it, it's a logical, it's a rational, it's a philosophical discussion. I didn't see any practical implementation or, 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 or of that. Um, sometimes I've seen uh, that there are uh, on phase one trialist uh, concerns about the fact that some uh, treatments uh, uh, used in palliative care may be not compatible uh, with uh, some uh, phase one trials. And so that should be shared, probably discussed uh, openly, not be in the, you know, in the back door of the, uh, uh, of the clinical situation. Dexamethasone, for instance, at times, uh, but this has been happening also in the past. So I think these are practical issues that can be solved. But certainly there is a certain degree of uh, um, lazy attitude towards uh, moving on, I would say. Professional lazy attitude. Okay, Kim, do you, have a, you, you, you raised a hand and then Karen wants to have a comment as well. Yeah, I, I was just wondering if you mean that all patients then should have uh, palliative care visits or is it that it should be an option and offered? Luke, what was your uh, idea? So I think one way to do that is to try to find uh, some empirical solutions as uh, as uh, uh, in trials, uh, uh, because we still need a, uh, need to have some research. I, I think Camilla Zimmerman's example is very good. Their referral criteria to palliative care is a wide uh, subject uh, at the moment, so I think it's maybe peculiar for phase one trials, but it's not, but it's a general subject. So you can adapt it to trials look at one system, Camilla's suggestion is good, maybe we should move on from that and see what happens. Because the, on the other way, you cannot also, uh, to refer all patients uh, with a certain uh, level of disease to specialized palliative care is probably not feasible. Maybe it is feasible to yes, refer okay. some, those that are going some kind of trials because they are a, a small number, but we have to mm -hmm. address it in practice, not just uh, uh, in discussions. I, I, I have a short comment because because I believe, Kim, that uh, the patients who are consenting to be in a phase one study, that's a sub, sub cohort or a larger cancer cohort of patients. And uh, I, I think we need to custom make a palliative care program to them, not take the program that we are using all the time. So th this is a good research question. What what would be the content? made program in my mind for uh, people patients who are consenting to take part in a early phase clinical trial by the way we are now like to use the the terminal terminology early clinical trials than phase one because the traditional phase ones are disappearing by the way okay karen uh, maybe you could give you the last comments because we have in a minute then we have to move on uh, I think we have to realize that it's indeed a specific group of uh, patients. Um, uh, uh, medically, they have to be in a rather good condition. You, uh, you don't have to include a patient in a bad condition in an early phase clinical trial. So uh, they have to be a life expectancy, which is not uh, too, uh, too short. And it is a special group of patients because they really, I think in general, have the hope 
um, uh, that uh, the new medication will uh, will help them. And the hope is also important for them because it's also a, a part of, of their quality of life. And I think that's really important to realize for palliative care, that for those patients, hope is a part of their quality of life. Okay, look, I think uh, our time is running out, actually. I've been asked to, uh, to close down uh, in three minutes. So uh, thanks to the panel. Um, it's my privilege to to close the whole uh, seminar right now, and um, it's it's some sort of uh, strange, uh, but I'm I'm very happy. I'm very happy because uh, all of you, all of you who are participating, have presented excellent work, excellent presentations, and we have had a lot of uh, listeners and participants, more than 350 have been participating in this PRC seminar. And they are coming from all over Europe and from very, very many countries around the world. Uh, I'm very impressed with the quality uh, of the presentations. And I'm also very impressed with the digital producers from the Norwegian Cancer Society. This was the first time I was involved so close to and uh, within a digital meeting. And so, uh, Håvard Seberg and Vegard Skarhol, uh, thanks a lot. You did a tremendous job on behalf uh, of yourself, your team, and the Norwegian Cancer Society. And most of all, thanks to, to Tonje. Uh, you have been there all the time, and you have been preparing uh, uh, really, really all the time. So um, to end up, what's next? We have heard uh, from uh, Chris, from Chris Fissers from Nijmegen, that you are welcoming us uh, to Holland in 2021. And I think you have said it more than three or four times. And I'm very happy to have such a nice welcoming committee. So I, I hope that, um, that we can next year meet physically and maybe the next type of seminars, I don't know, will be some sort of combination with uh, being physically, being there on site, as well as being digital. Uh, if we should really look forward and see, well, how, how will meetings be in the future? Um, and then finally, uh, there were some good questions during today's seminar about, can I participate uh, in a study which was presented? I think Kim was asked about that. And I must say on behalf of PRC and everyone here that we welcome everyone to participate uh, in research because we believe that working together strengthen the quality of the research. We have different competence. We are coming from different countries. We are coming from different areas uh, of expertise. And if we can work together, that's like the, the basis of palliative care. So I hope to see all of you soon on site and digitally and taking contact with us if you want to be an active PRC center and or if you want to participate in any of our projects. So thanks to everyone. Thanks uh, to uh, my co-chair uh, during uh, this uh, session. Uh, look, it's a great pleasure to collaborate uh, with all of you. And thanks to Augusto and thanks to everyone. So um, enjoy the rest of the day and uh, I hope you have a nice weekend. So thanks a lot, everyone.